Intro. This is the intro to the Carmudgeon Show, the episode about air-cooled 911s. Is it? It is, yes. I'm, I'm In this episode, I discuss we discuss the air-cooled 911 and its evolution over the decades, uh, despite it not being the most interesting choice in a sea of wacko old cars i'm gonna let you keep digging yourself uh deeper and unfortunately i have to apologize to everyone i ate my entire lunch which consists of one blueberry almond breakfast bar packet and then three little ones um i tried to stay away from the microphone but if you hear chomping that's me sorry um i also have to say that uh who you are and who I am, because I failed to do that. Okay, that is Derek Tam Heifetz Scott. I am Jason Kamisa. This is the Carmudgeon Show, and part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. And if you'd like to help support Haggerty's content, including this podcast, you can join the Haggerty Drivers Club. It includes a subscription to our award winning magazine, unlimited access to our valuation tool, 24 7 flatbed roadside assistance for all of your classic cars, f- free classified listings, exclusive coupons and offers, and early access and VIP perks to select Haggerty events there's more information in a link that is ostensibly below unless i forget to put it in ostensibly yes rock and roll with the clapping the clap hello to your what is this lunch afternoon snack you know there's nothing in this office. There's no food in here. And we're often, we go out to eat. It takes forever. We have carb overload and we fall asleep. So I'm doing the, the responsible thing, which is to crunch on camera for our audience. Is that no. responsible? It was not crunchy. Okay. Um, this uh, foreshadows that maybe I'll be doing more talking this episode than you. You can have a nap over there. Okay. Uh, okay. So this episode is about air cooled nine elevens. Groan. Okay, Jason. Why do you groan about air cooled nine elevens? I can't talk right now. My mouth is full. They're so good. They're good. No, the candy bars that I mean, the uh-huh. kind bar, kind mini caramel almonds. All, no, air cooled nine elevens are so good. Are they? They really are. They're well engineered, well executed cars that don't have f- flaws. I sh- but they're like made of flaws. Except that, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is like, I'm just going to cover my face. <laughs> they are made of flaws, but so are humans. They all get all existential and shit. Philosophical. Yeah, but a lot of cars are are not made of flaws okay what i mean by that is problem errors they're not piles of shit yes they don't rust into the ground yes they do not the way w220 s classes do i mean that's an exceptional level of rustiness and i learned recently did we talk about this god we're already talking about old mercedes i learned why that generation of mercedes is prone to rust Water-based primer. Yes, you told me about this, and that was it. You who told me about this, and that yeah, if my it was Mike the f- bought one that was four years old and it was rusted through. But not all of them are like this, mm. and I learned why that not all of them are like this. Apparently, whatever they put in the the primer that was p- to prevent degradation and the de- the deposition of the um, the anti-rust, the galvanizing, mm-hmm. um, they were sp- that it would only last for a couple of days, but they would change the tanks every two weeks. And so if the car was built during the first two days after or so after they had changed whatever was in the tanks, then they wouldn't rust. But if it was made after the first two or so days, then they rusted. So the, some some of their, like, you know, what is that? A 10% of the ones built shouldn't be too rusty. How the fuck does that happen? <laughs> I don't know. It's not very Mercedes-Benz. It's probably trying to be environmentally friendly. Like everything else they did during that period. Anyway, so some 220s and 210s are really rusty and uh, others are not. It just depends when mm-hmm. during that cycle of changing the the whatever the rust proofing stuff in the tanks was. That's insane. Um, anyway. Listen, everything pre-galvanized is a rust bucket. Mm-hmm. Right? You take any car from the 1960s, you put it outside in a climate where there's humidity or rain and they're going to rust. Mm-hmm. But... Sorry, God, those kind bars are impossible to get down quickly. 
when you're talking about cars with that are inherent shit piles, we're talking about engines that blow up at 30,000 miles, like GM V8 diesels or mm. frames that crack. 30. That's a lot. Right. <laughs> for one of those. Or frames that crack or cars that were just inherently terrible to drive. Um, or had big structural weaknesses, or engines that failed, or, you know, 9-11s had handling vices in that they require a certain amount of skill to drive, um, but they're long-lasting, they're stout, they're well-engineered, they perform well in crashes, they just kind of do all things really well, and they really marry the GT ideal of being able to use a car and having it just be an extension of yourself rather than being a pain in the ass, with the ability to put a smile on your face. And I'm mm. done. I'm not going to say another fucking nice word about a 911. Okay. Uh so I the the my goal with this episode is that there's a lot of like landscape with the air-cooled 911s and people sometimes loop them all together, sometimes they do not loop them together, uh, lump them all together. Uh it kind of depends on your experience level. And so my goal is to tr- sort of go on a journey through the progress of the air-cooled 911 this would be you know when the, it came out in 1963 uh, until they stopped making them in 98 97 98 because uh, there's a lot of variations that occurred then and i'm going to try to i guess explain the differences in character as we go along i think that's great but i think the audience needs to stop and think about that for a second how many years was this car in production so yes 60 35 Imagine you would walk into any dealership today and being able and be able to buy a car that is 35 years old. And this used to be a thing. I mean, it wasn't as uncommon as it is now. But, you know, the Jag XJS was in production for 20 years. The Porsche 928 was in production forever. The This was, you know, R- Range Rover R- Classic. R107 was in production forever. There was less of this sort of turnover. But I think the fundamental architecture of the 911 was intact during this period. It's not like the 911, you know, now you say the 911 has been in production for 60 years or however long it is. Wow, 60 years. Um, But it's not the same car. There was 0% carryover, whereas the fundamental architecture of the 911 did not change. You know, like the the size and dimensions of the side windows and and all of the windows actually did not change in the 911 between when it came out in 1963 and when the last air-cooled car, the 993, went out of production in 1997-98. Uh, so, you know, the, the layout of the gauges was a little bit, you know, was consistent throughout that period, too. There, you know, it's the, the chassis is basically the same, uh, you know, the fundamental architecture of the car it does not change during that period. So uh, in the beginning, when the 911 first came out, it was review- it was regarded with some suspicion by Porsche purists, actually. They were like, this is absurd. You're changing things and it's all newfangled and stuff. Uh, because Porsche had only made one car up to that point. That was a street car. That was the 356. And so to... Which was mid-engined. 356 was not mid-engined. Uh, sorry. The 550 was. the 550, So they did make mid-engined race cars, but right. they were always, uh, you know, Volks, Volkswagen-derived rear-engine cars. Uh, and so they're like, it's an all-new car. Imagine if someone, which is kind of what happened later with the 928 when they were going to replace the 911 with it, there was some unrest because they're like, this is too big of a departure. Uh, and so the car was actually, now it's weird to imagine this because it was so revered, or it is so revered now, but, you know, it, among Porsche purists, it caused some hand-wringing when the 911 appeared in the 60s, hmm. uh, which is funny because now it's so embedded as a thing. Yeah, it lasted for 35 years. Yeah, so they were two liters air-cooled. Uh, they were with a so-called short wheelbase car. Short wheelbase cars went from 65 to 68 um, two liter flat six. Two liter flat six, yes. Uh, replacing the 1600 cc pushrod flat four. Uh, we're not talking about the racing engines, which were also available uh, in 356s. Uh, two liter, 130 horsepower. They're not terribly fast. They have skinny tires and wheels. They're four and a half inch wide steel wheels, wood steering wheels, you know, green gauge faces and chrome. It's a very 1960s look and feel. Uh, and they, you, you know, they went to long wheelbase in 69, uh, but still left them with two liter engines. And then in 70, they w- increased the engine displacement to 2.2 liters. Okay, so why the change to, I'm, gonna, I'm going to represent the... Neophyte. Person, I don't know what that means. The person who's eating while watching this on YouTube. So, okay. <laughs> um, 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 why the long wheelbase stretch? 
Uh, so the, the overall length of the car did not change when they increased the wheelbase. So they just moved the rear wheels aft. And that was to cure the wayward handling issue of the early 911s. The early 911s were known for being handfuls because the weight distribution was so rear biased. And so by moving the rear wheels back by about two inches, uh, they didn't move the transmission or engine and they didn't change the length of the car. They just moved the wheels back. So the drive shaft, the, the half shafts are angled on all long wheelbase 911s until they probably redesigned the transmission, which they did for the 72 model year when the 915 came out. So they're angled rearward. They're angled rearwards, uh, so they didn't have to move anything else. Mm -hmm. But that was to improve the car's weight distribution. The early cars had lead weights in the front to improve the weight distribution to shift it forward. Um, and so they, the other thing that they did to increase rear grip was they went to staggered wheels. Although the standard, the Carrera got staggered wider rear wheels for more grip in seventy late 72, 73 model year. Uh, and then I guess it probably became standard sometime later in the 70s to have wider rear wheels. From a driving from the driver's seat, can you really tell the difference between a long wheelbase and a short wheelbase car? It's hard to answer that question because they made so many other changes around the same time. Uh, there is, we tend to lump, these cars are called long hoods. Long hoods because they, that's before they went to impact bumpers, the hood is physically longer before they move the bumpers higher, so they shortened the hood. So you can tell a long, a long hood when you look, it extends past the fenders, correct? Yes. Uh, and so all these long hood cars now, I think by especially more younger enthusiasts, they differentiate long hoods and impact bumper cars but they don't really differentiate among all the long hoods. And there's actually a lot of character difference. If you drive like a 65 911, it's quite different from driving like a 71, actually. I have. I've driven, it's, I drove a 65. Mm -hmm. And other than the fact that it was very sweet little uh, flat six, sounded, sounded aggressive, didn't really move all that yeah, quickly. It's slow. It's 130 um, horsepower. But the, the thing that I remember the most was the steering wheel was enormous. Mm -hmm. And the steering and wheel wood and shifter would, and the shifter almost hit the steering wheel. There was kind of like yes. no actual room for a human in there because the steering wheel and the shifter all took it up. Yes. And these are dogleg cars with pretty vague shifters. Very it's vague. a very, um, it's a decidedly 1960s experience. And when they went to the, you know, I would say the first really modern, f Modern is such a weird word. Decisively different feeling 911 is, you know, probably the, the 2.2 liter cars. But they, you know, they changed the engine and you're just <laughs> going to eat all of those. Well, that, this was my meal. It was this three minutes. your lunch. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, there is a there is an appreciable difference. But a lot of it is wheel width. Like when you go to four and a half, the four and a half versus five and a half inch <laughs> wheel cars, there's a, a, an appreciable difference in, in grip for sure. Um, okay. so let's see. So then the Targa appears in 67. 67 also marks the appearance of the 911S, which is the same displacement, but 30 more horsepower. So it's 160 horsepower instead of 130. And Targa appeared in that form because Porsche, like many automakers, believed that the, the convertible was going to be outlawed in the U.S. market because of rollover, pending rolling, rollover litig um, legislation Correct. that didn't happen. Correct. And so the early ones, it's basically just a hoop, uh, and the rear window zips out separately from the hard top part that goes over the passenger compartment. Uh, so you could basically have an almost completely open air car. It just has a roll bar like a VW Cabriolet. Uh, but the zip out rear window was plastic, and it was a pain in the ass, and everybody like was very annoyed by it. And so you could optionally get glass, and then eventually they were like, they should can the plastic. Now those soft window cars, they're called soft window Targas, are mega valuable. Uh, like there's a huge value premium for a soft window car over a glass window Targa. Uh, but yeah, the glass, the soft window Targa has disappeared, I think, around 69. Uh, so yes, open roofed version. And then there was no Cabriolet a version of the 911 at all until the 83 model year when the SC Cabriolet came out. And then, of course, it was just in time for the 80s wildness and those cars sold really well. And then the Targa sort of staggered along as a sort of random aside, which it has kind of been ever since the Cabriolet. Is. Yeah came out in 83 which is now 30 40 years ago sorry <laughs> um so 911s is a uh, you know it's all the old-fashioned tuning differences to get more performance without more displacement so aggressive cam timing higher compression ratio it's a racy car that needs the piss revved out of it to go anywhere uh and so then they introduced an intermediate model called, called the e which is all so the all of them were carbureted up until this point uh, until, s depending on the market, 69, 
uh, is when they started going to fuel injection. And so the E comes out and that's between the T and the S and it's, it's E for Einspritz, you know, fuel injection. Uh, and that's a more flexible, but still more power, more powerful and flexible than more flexible than the 911 S and more powerful than the than T. The and do, what, what did T stand for? Was there anything? E for I don't know. T, uh, S F for Super. <laughs> I don't know. Sport. Sport, yeah. Right. Uh, and then the 911R is also there. It's a race car only. They made 20 or something of those. And that's just strictly just a race car that's mega light. And they made 21 or something of those. Yeah, those are all short wheelbase cars. Um, I don't know. What now? So the E, by the way, that fuel injection was mechanical. Yes, with they're Porsche's all. own. Is it, is it's a Bosch system. system. It's a Bosch system. Yeah. Uh, similar to the, is a 3D cam system similar to the Mercedes stuff? Yes. It's got a little fuel injection pump. Uh, MFI is what, mm -hmm. the, is what Porsche people call that. So MFI is used until, well, it depends on the market again, because CIS appeared for the U.S. cars in 73 and a half uh, to replace the MFI for, I guess, emissions reasons. But in, in Europe, if you got a 73, it still had MFI. The RS is MFI, the T, the E, and the S are all MFI in 73. So, uh, and then you could get the MFI system until early 76 in the uh, overseas markets, but it was gone after 73 in the US. In the US. Uh, so yeah, I would the the character of the difference between a sixty five and an early seventies car is really pronounced, uh, especially if you're dealing in like a they, they call it a two point four. It's actually twenty three forty something, so it's actually two point three liters. But on the engine lid, it says two point four. A lot of people don't know that. This is typical of the German way of marking displacement, where which it's is not a which is not a bullshit kind of thing. It's just because in Germany you're taxed on the engine size and it were at were, and that is on the um, on the displacement for any 100 cc or portion thereof. Correct. So 2301 is taxed as a 2.4 liter. And that's why the 911's displacement, the, the two liter cars are 1991 cc's. And same reason why the you know Mercedes 6208 cc cars are 6.3 liters. Mm -hmm. Same, same all across German. So it's not that's not them trying to be uh, suspect. Diesel gaty. Yeah. Yes. And the 5.5 and 5.6 and the 80s and the Mercedes also. Uh, so yes, that's, that's the 2.4 liter car, which is actually 23.40 something. Um, so then you get these early 70 cars, I think are the ones that, unless you're hot rodding them. The, the, the long hood cars have a character that I would say is really genuinely vintage. Whereas when you get into the 70s, especially if the car's hot rodded a little bit, it's a car you could genuinely use. Oftentimes if someone is buying an early car and they're like, should I get a short wheelbase or a long wheelbase? And I was like, unless you specifically like the sort of the lightness and delicateness and scariness uh, and the 60s-ness of a short wheelbase car, I would say get a long wheelbase car. It's just a little bit more useful. It's a little bit more torquey. It's a little more contemporary. It's a little more performant. And so... What happened to the interiors? Because the early ones were very sort of non-plasticky, beautiful, intricate, yes, yes. jewelry-like. And I, I, that didn't carry through the 70s, did it? No. Okay. Um, the first change that they made that was substantive was they got rid of the chrome accents and the green font and the gauges after 67. So the, if you want maximum 60s experience, you're 67 or earlier short wheelbase. 68s are kind of weird one-year-only characteristics and a lot like have generally been considered less collectible because you lose the green gauges um you lose the uh early style door handles the, that, those door handles are actually only used in 68 and 69 so that's how you tell a 69 if it's a long wheelbase car with the, the one year, two year only door handles you know it's a 69 mm. um and, and and there's a way from the outside to tell long wheelbase versus short i remember you showing yes. me this years ago and i can't the distance between the torsion bar cover the head of the rear wheel if it's if the fender arch starts exactly where the torsion bar cover is and it's a short wheelbase car and if it there's a couple of inches between the torsion bar cover and the rear wheel arch then it's a long and wheelbase long car. car and the sh the rear lights are shaped differently they're long they're a little slimmer on the, the short wheelbase cars i mean these are really subtle differences yes yes but i mean i can look at every year of 911 pretty much on site and narrow it down to like 2 years like right. there's a couple of exceptions 7071 look the same uh 72 and 73 are different some of the 76, 77 are pretty hard to tell apart. Mm. Uh, 78 to 80 look the same. If you can see the interior, you can tell a 78, 80 differently from an 81 to 83. 
Um, every year of three, two, pretty much, I can tell apart. Uh, if you know what to look for, I, I, I yeah. can't imagine this is interesting. But if anyone wants to know how to yeah. do this, this it's possible. Um, so will, some, one person, someone will, yes, I'm somewhere. No, I think it's neat. Uh, so the the yeah, you lose the green gauges after sixty seven, and the wood steering wheel was an, actually an option during pretty much all of this period too. So you, that's not that helpful for, for, for being definitive. Uh, the interior lost all of the bright work, almost all of the bright work by the uh, by sixty nine, mm. pretty much. Um, so yes, there's one year only long wheelbase two liter car. And then 70, 71 are all 2.2s. Uh, and then 72, 73 are all 2.3s, 2.4s. Uh, but they have an exterior oil flap, which everyone knows, on 72s. So that's how you tell a 72 from a 73. Everybody knows. All the 911 people uh, know that on the right rear fender, they this was, I don't know. The reason why they did this is because the oil tank initially was behind the right rear wheel. And they were like, hmm, it would improve the weight distribution if we put the oil tank in front of the right rear wheel instead of behind it so that it's closer to the center of mass of the car. Uh, but then it made reaching the oil tank difficult because it's like, you know basically on behind the door right and so they put a little flap there where you could access it and then put oil in but of course full service fuel service stations expect a f door on the right rear fender to be fuel so they were always full service gas stations were always the guys were always putting gas in the oil tank which is bad <laughs> that's why you never move to new jersey yes new jersey or, or oregon oregon where they pump the gas for you yes uh they will destroy your 911 so they did that in 72 only, and then they were like, fuck this, we got to undo this because this is a, a functional difficulty. So they moved the oil tank back behind the right rear wheel uh, where it stayed until 89. In, and then the 964 came out, they moved the oil tank back, but they left the filler in the engine compartment uh, and just put a very long tube on it, yeah. uh, which was really the solution they should have done in 72. Yeah. Uh, so the oil tank did move eventually back there for for that reason. So seventy two one year only oil tank is it, it's a dry sump, so it has a substantial tank full of oil. How many uh, quarts of oil did they use in total? Uh, eleven. Eleven yeah. or so. Yeah, it's between ten and eleven. A lot of oil. Well, there's no coolant. coolant. Yeah. It is the coolant. So mm -hmm. when you think about it like that, it's not so offensive, mm -hmm. especially since oil weighs less than uh, water per gallon. Yes. <laughs> By two pounds per gallon. There's a two pound, or, or, that's gasoline. That's I don't know about if oil, how much oil weighs actually per gallon. I'm sorry. I have not done this research. Somebody um, from Mobile One, reach out and let us know. That's yeah. Uh, so then they went uh, impact bumper in 74. And 74 was like, those cars, 74 to 77, are called mid-years. Mm -hmm. It's the first of the impact bumper cars. They were like derided as shitty for a long time. Because um, of the bumpers. Because of the bumpers and because the car got heavier but didn't really gain any power because they were trying to meet emissions. And so the cars got heavier, so they got slower without really picking up power. The MFI is a really actually pretty spicy way to do for, for induction to, and injection to occur. And CIS is kind of um, more civilized and modern and a little bit less exciting to interact with. You stumbled on the question that I was going to ask because often we we have cars that were carbureted and became fuel injected, especially when they became fuel injected with Bosch CIS, KJtronic. They mm -hmm. sort of lost a lot of the edge mm -hmm. and a lot of the intake noise. Some of yes. them. I mean, some yes. some cars are spectacular with it. Yeah. Tell me the difference between the carbureted cars, MFI cars, and CIS cars in terms of personality yes. and what you experience. So... The carbureted cars vary depending on what kind of carburetors they have. The early ones are Solexes. They're triple throats. Uh, so two triple throat carburetors, one for each bank. Uh, and then the 911S had Webers. And that was like the big deal was that you got the high performance carburetors. And you get everything that comes that you expect to get with Webers. And so what are the things that you usually associate with Webers? Having to put my foot on the floor to start it. Yes. Um, and kind of just generally go anywhere. They're optimized right. for full throttle right. use. They're not the most flexible carburetors. Mm -hmm. And they put, you know, colder plugs in them that are more likely to foul. So a 911S really needs to have the... It just need It benefits from having the carbureted 911Ss. Really like to have them used in Italian tune-up regularly. They're not happy if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. So the Solexes are pretty docile by comparison to the Webers, which are a little spicier, but need to be used at full throttle to get the most out of them. MFI, to me, is like the ultimate way to do an old 911 in terms of fuel injection. 
or no, in terms of fueling generally, they have lots of character. They have these long intake runners, uh, and you get all this noise. They just have there's they're really exciting, and the CIS is sort of meh, you know it's fuel injected. It's pleasant enough. It's re- everything you would associate with CIS. It works, but it doesn't have as much texture and spice. So MFI cars are generally preferred to C- CIS injected ones. And CIS started seventy three and a half in the US. seventy three and a half in the US for the nine eleven T only, and then became standard on all seventy four and later cars. And seventy four and seventy five, seventy five especially, is where shit really went badly for the US market in terms of emissions tightening up so much that everything lost a ton of power. Yeah. Um, how badly did the nine eleven fare? Because it had CIS, there's basically no difference. Once they switched to CIS, they were they used that system continuously until they went to electronic fuel injection for the 84 model year. That's pretty amazing when you think about the amount of power that was lost by the I, American stuff. I do have to add a comment there, actually. Thermal reactors. <sighs> so CIS was... and They did use thermal reactors through the 70s before they went to have, three-way catalysts. I think you're going to have to f- explain what a thermal okay. reactor is. So nowadays when we do... Uh, emissions control, we do a closed loop system with a computer brain that closed loop means there's an oxygen sensor in the exhaust and that is transmitting information to the computer brain, which is telling it about what's happen- how the engine is combusting and then the computer brain makes adjustments accordingly based on the information it gets from the exhaust. Uh, and that is used typically in conjunction with a catalytic converter and the catalytic converter is called a three-way catalyst because it addresses NOx, SOx, and what is it, particulate? What's the third thing in the three-way catalyst? Hydrocarbons. Uh, So that's like the way that was happened, or not happened, was engineered into existence generally in the late 70s, early 80s, and that's like a modern way you want to control all this stuff, where you're getting information in, and then you make adjustments accordingly, and you have a catalyst that addresses all three of those things. The other thing to note, man, are we going to talk about stoichiometry? I think we are. I mean, sure. Okay, so... Uh, NOx, SOx, and uh, hydrocarbons all have these curves associated with where stoichiometry is. You need 14.7 parts air to one part fuel in order to completely burn the fuel. That's how much air you need to, uh, um, by mass. Uh, by mass. By mass and this to is completely this- combust uh, f- fuel. And so if you are running stoichiometrically, that means that you are running at 14.7 to 1 air to fuel ratio mm-hmm. there are benefits to running richer you get more power richer, richer meaning more fuel per unit volume which means of air. a lower number than 14.7 like 11 or 12 or 13 which is opposite and counterintuitive right because we think of richer meaning more gas as a higher number but it's the other way around because it's air to fuel Correct. so 10 to 1 would be 10 parts of air to fuel meaning more fuel which for is very rich air, which is very rich uh, and that'll have lower combustion temperatures, and uh, you should probably, up to a certain point, get more power also. Up to a, yeah, up to a uh, small point. A- adding fuel. But because you are you don't have enough air to fully combust all of that fuel... Then you'll have a lot of HC, hydrocarbons, unburnt fuel going out of the exhaust, Correct. which is bad. Right. If you go the other direction of stoichiometric, then you are running, you're burning lean, and you create uh, nitri- oxides of nitrogen because normally you want NO2, but if you don't have enough air, then you can't do NO2. You're doing NO1 instead, and that's NOx. So if you so there's this magical narrow window that you need to operate in of of, of air to fuel ratio to minimize or to reach the point on all three of those curves where they're sort of not lowest but all the least high that they can be given the concerns about the other two curves that you have. We should just put a picture up, and that well, here, yeah, there's a picture for that. But then the other thing, just to remember, is that the, the sort of Cliff Notes version of that is your fuel injection system or your carburetor has one job, and that is to measure the amount of air that's coming in the engine and to supply the appropriate amount of fuel. That holds true whether it's a single bar- barrel carburetor or you know ITBs on a V12 that's with modern fuel injection and a and a particular trap right so it's measuring air in applying the appropriate amount of fuel and then a closed loop system monitors that exhaust to make sure that the that the mixture of air to fuel is in as this very one small narrow window to minimize effectively all of the emissions emissions in some case or other times maximize power depending on whether it's a race car that's carbureted or a modern street car being sold to yahoo's but usually, and certainly in the 1970s, the goal was minimizing emissions um, and so that 
the catalytic converters were able to, they had also a very small window in which they were able to effectively clean up the exhaust in terms of temperatures and everything else. So you had mm -hmm. cars with exhaust temperature lights on them mm -hmm. uh, to tell you the catalytic converter had gotten too hot from either running too rich or too lean because both can cause that. Um, da -da 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 -da. But that is still going on today. Mm -hmm. Thermal reactors are Thermal not. reactors are not. Thermal reactors were thankfully put out to pasture by the advent of the three-way catalyst with lam lambda sensors. Being, um, lambda sensor being an The oxygen, oxygen sensor, sensor, yes. Um, I remember as an aside that Volvo put Lambda Sond on mm -hmm. the uh, grills, grills of their 240s yeah. in the early 80s. And I was a child once and there was a guy who had that on his car and I asked the dude what it meant and he said, I have no idea. You were a child once? When, once? once when I was a child, oh. I asked that question, um, yes. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, so thermal reactors. So thermal reactors. Alternative way. Yes. The, a, a shittier way of doing this. As was CVVC. CVCC, complex, hold on, compound, compound vortex, vortex controlled combustion yes. was the Honda Civic, and that's yes. obviously where the name came from. Also, that was Honda's way of having a pre-chamber to more effectively burn everything. But that wasn't really all that bad because no. Honda CVC cars could pass U.S. emissions tests without a catalytic converter. Mm -hmm. um, and that was intrinsic efficiency, whereas a uh, thermal reactor is an after treatment. E correct. Okay. And I don't. Go ahead. I know nothing about how they work, other than they get really hot and break. Yes. So <laughs> what what they would do is basically recombust. It's like EGR almost. It's like you're re, you're adding. It's like an afterburner for a car. Right, it's adding extra. You fuel add fuel to in the exhaust burner, which is in the exhaust system mounted downstream from the engine, where you would more completely combust the exhaust gases. And what that tells you is that you're adding fuel and burning stuff and generating heat but there's no way to get power from that. So it's bad for fuel economy, mm -hmm. even though it's better for emissions. Uh, and they, in the case of a 911, the thermal reactor is directly mounted to the cylinder head, which is alloy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those cars would get real hot and they cook the heads. Mm -hmm. And so those, or, those thermal reactor 911s are, have a very bad reputation. Porsche has consistently technically innovated and then caused problems in 911s. This happened with the 996. Uh, people may be more familiar with the 996 problems, rear main seal leaks, air oil separators, rear, uh, and uh, intermediate mm -hmm. shaft failures. Uh, so anytime there's like a major technology change in a 911, you get all these technical problems. Uh, and then eventually people solve those problems and they're like, they're not so bad now. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's because they've all had their intermediate shafts done and remain seals and air oil separators. Uh, and so the same thing happened with the mid-year. This also happened with the 964 when it came out in 89 because they went to a head gasketless system for sealing, which didn't work for shit. And so those cars all have oil leaks. And then the other issue with those cars is they have a, they have twin distributors where the second distributor is driven by a belt off of the first distributor. Uh, and they would, the belt would get too hot and it would break. Uh, and the, so there was a distributor vent upgrade is a thing that all 964s need to have. Okay, it's cooling for the belt. Okay, we're not the there second. yet. Though. We haven't even gotten yes. to Carrera 3 too. So we're at thermal reactors. What year are the thermal reactor cars? Uh, I think it's 76, 77, okay. and maybe 75. But they didn't even lose a ton of power the way other cars did. No, they were still impressive. had around 150 horsepower. I mean, if you... So the US... There was only one US 911 engine during this period. You We didn't get a couple of the hot engines. And so this is a reflection of that. If you have the aggressive cam timing and high compression ratios of the Euro cars, then we just didn't get them. So there was a Carrera 3.0 during this period, which we never got. We only got two sevens. Mm -hmm. So the engine, so the impact bumper cars went up to 2.7 liters. Power didn't really increase. So they increased displacement, power stayed more or less stable, and they added emissions equipment. And this was the way that, this is the 70s thing that everyone was doing. Yeah, except most people added huge amounts of displacement. Uh, and added, power uh, would be halved. Right, literally like, With like a 350 cubic inch Chevy yeah. engine or something I mean, there like was that. also the problem that uh, American the Car Company was region gross, and, yeah, and, and which was just made up bullshit number, and correct. then SAE net. Um, so, you know, but it, it, the 911 did survive Relatively, relatively intact yeah. it was it was a car that w never got truly piggish but it was just not as zippy as they had been before and so they were derided for that reason uh now with emission standards no longer being relevant for the 74s and 75s in california and all of those cars for everywhere else probably uh 74s the mid-year cars 74s to 77s don't have the same sort of negative connotation that they did because the technical problems were resolved by mm -hmm. a lot of those two sevens when they got cooked were replaced by three liters out of later cars 
uh, or, you know, you rebuild it and then when you're free from emissions controls and can spend a bit of money, then you rebuild it like a 2.7 Carrera if you have unlimited money. Uh, and then and you get this... the thermal reactor. Yes, you get no smog equipment and then you do like good fuel injection. If you're if you're doing this on a budget, you put Weber's on. If you're going to do this in the expensive, exciting way, you put find MFI from another car and put that on. But there are ways to... You know, even with CIS, you can actually make them enjoyable too. Uh, so everyone sort of undid the emissions controls from those cars and if they survived. But the 74, 74s are, have a bunch of one-year-only characteristics that mid-year nerds care about that most people otherwise don't. I would say of the mid-year, 76 and 77 are the least desirable. 74s are the most desirable because they have the one-year-only dark blue upholstery instead of black, which some people care about. Mm. More like chrome on the fog lights. There's a bunch of like sort of lighter weight structure <laughs> stuff too. What else? Floor pans started being galvanized in 71 for rust reasons. That's really early. Floor pans only. Mm-hmm. Whole car went galvanized in 77. Still early. Yes. Uh, well, the cars were prone to rust. Um, so everything was pre-galvanization, but yes. 77 was early. Piech, Mr. Piech, one day when we get to our Ferdinand Piech episode, uh, he was a huge proponent of full, fully galvaniz- full galvanization. And I believe Audi, was the fir- which was under his guidance, mm-hmm. was the first manufacturer to have their entire lineup fully galvanized. Yeah. Um, it's a world of difference in terms of rust in, protection. In cars su- surviving, for sure. Absolutely. Because the early ones, if you're thinking about one, you really want to look for rust. Uh, f- suspension floor pans, the batteries are in the front, the acid kind of hangs out in the trunk floor, and then the floor rusts out, battery boxes. Like, there's a lot of common rust spots for those cars. Uh, so, yes, those are the mid year cars. We did. We only got one engine, which is the 2.7 in one state of tune. We got a Carrera in 74 and 75 only, and then it was just the 911, or I guess it was 911 and 911S, which were just trim differences mm-hmm. for the U.S. market in 76, 77. The turbo arrived for the 76 model year. That was exciting. Um, well, for the two seconds that it's on boost during the entire yeah, 100,000 miles exactly. experiment. Um, and then 78 uh, the, is when probably the substantial changes. The, the, this, the car that came out in 78 was the SC, and that is the car that particularly in retrospect made the mid-years look shitty. So they just did a lot of engineering and solving of problems for the SC in 78 that made them sort of return to the form that was sort of lost when the first impact bumper cars came out for emissions reasons. So this is one of the, the confusing things because prior to the 911 SC, if you had a number, a letter after the 911, it meant something different. T was base model, E was injection, S was the, the fast one. Super. If it said Carrera on it, it was really fast. Mm-hmm. If it said R, it was for, you know, it was a racing, racing. homologation. Yeah. RS was a really spicy model. Now you have SC as the base car. Um, yes. And that's a little bit tough to to wrap our head around. The only thing, the, the, all the parallel is all 911s are now Carreras, right? Yes. Um, it's sort of that thing where the 911 SC was just the base car. Correct. And there was the only 911 besides the turbo that was available during that time. The During the mid-year era, the U.S. did have the nine, base 911 for a while and the 911S and the Carrera, but the base 911 was dropped from the U.S. market, I think, in 76 if I remember correctly. So for a hot second, there was just the 911S mm-hmm. for the U.S. market because we had the Carrera, which was, had it had the performant engine, would have been very exciting. And without that engine, it was okay. You got wider rear flares to accommodate. It was designed to accommodate an 8-inch rear wheel. Uh, and you had, you know, front and rear sway bars and Bilsteins instead of bogey shocks and, you know, uh probably some trim differences so it was the top of the line model during that period but they're mostly cosmetic a few like sort of chassis changes but nothing like really sexy like the difference between a gt3 now Mm -hmm. Uh, but carrera has like the carrera rs historically the first one in 73 that was the gt3 of its day right uh, and so the SC came out. There was the only car besides the turbo that was available. It continued along relatively unchanged for a long time because of this famous story about how the 911 was supposed to be replaced by the 928 during this period. We talked about this recently mm-hmm. about how when Peter Schutz was hired, he drew on despite. the wall, despite his German name, mm-hmm. uh, he drew on the wall that the 911 would continue indefinitely and how that was a big morale boost and customers really liked it too because the... the 
people did not take to the 928 from a sales perspective or any other perspective uh, in a way that made Porsche comfortable enough to shit can the 911, which was originally well, supposed that was to the be plan. the plan. And by the way, when you say he drew, drew on the wall, he literally drew on the wall. There was yes. a timeline in the Porsche office of all of the cars they had made and 911 uh, was supposed to end for 81, end, I think. Yeah. Um, somewhere in there, and of course I believe you, whatever you say, um, and the, the the arrow sort of ended, and he just, he wrote on the wall with a marker and just well, made it Well, he wrote to the, off the edge of the paper yep. and onto the wall and then around the corner of the next wall yep. to show the 911 was going to be un- continuing indefinitely. Right. And so that's why the SC was unchanged basically for five years because they, they were sort of, it was a run out model. They mm-hmm. were just like, okay, they were going to kill this thing. Mm-hmm. And then the result of him drawing that line was the Carrera 3.2. So the, the SC... Let's back up for a minute. Mm-hmm. The SC was three liters CIS still with the rear fender flares from the Carrera. So you gain uh, the ability to put, you can actually fit a nine inch rear wheel inside of those flares. Uh, so it um, looks more or less the same. I prefer early SCs because they have a little more 70s vibe to the interior. It's just a little bit more rad. There was weirder colors too. So early SCs to me are kind of neat. And the European Carrera 30, which is basically kind of the same car although it's actually a different engine it's a magnesium block 930 engine with high compression instead of six and a half to one 930 being the turbo the turbo yes sorry thank you and um uh yeah 200 horsepower was that it's it's an unturbocharged 930 engine Mm -hmm. with um compression actual compression Mm -hmm. actual compression uh, okay. So those are cool cars. Those are Europe only for 76 and 77. That's actually the impact bumper car I most want to own. I mean, I, well, no, the one I want is the MFI car, but you can't get their Stupid 200 grand. question. Why did Europe get impact bumpers one that was a U.S. regulation? Um, manufacturing simplicity, mm-hmm. I think. Okay. It was designed aesthetically. Like when you look at the way that other people did impact bumpers during that era, like for example, look at a 74 E-Type or an MGB uh, or the way Mercedes did things. I mean, <sighs> like they're just absolutely egregious and terrible and porsche like sort of set out to be like okay these regulations are part of the landscape let's integrate them aesthetically to the best of our ability and i think they did a better job than pretty much anyone else during this era and it was you know good enough that they left that impact bumper aesthetic intact for 15 years 74 to 89 the impact bumper aesthetic Mm -hmm. was used and the the reason impact is uh this was all based on u.s it's not really safety regulations, but U.S. regulations that required bumpers to be uh, good to up to an, an impact five of five miles, miles per hour without sustaining any damage to the body. Right. So the, yes. So the bumpers were often put on shock absorbers mm-hmm. and could move in. So rather and than big just, blocks of rubber to absorb yeah. a five mile yeah. per hour impact. And so those accordions you see on the side are because the bumper, the bumper can actually is move. on hydraulic shocks yep. and moves backwards or forwards depending so, on. Yeah, and that's direction. everything from seventy. Four, four to eighty nine. Uh, Porsche wise was eighty nine, yes. but yeah, nineteen seventy four is when the when the big bumper rules hit. So you'll see that on like yes. a nineteen seventy four Alpha has very yes. or a BMW two thousand two. That yes. all of a sudden they have enormous bumpers on. Yes, them. that's why. And it's an afterthought because they're just like we got to keep this car in production and we can't make substantive changes to the body shell. So we're just going to throw these really unfortunate bumpers on. Uh, in for it depend yeah for seventy four effectively. Uh, so the SC arrives and it has, you know, 180 horsepower instead of like 150 horsepower. It's three liters. It's got CAS. It's got a catalytic converter. Um, it's this got these, a 78, 78, 78 model year. Uh, and so it's just like finally kind of restoring the 911's performance to the level it was at before the, the emissions laws and to some extent the weight imposed by the impact bumper law, the impact bumper thing in 74. So it basically returns to where they were in 73. And so people are like, yay, this is a good one. And those cars are pretty durable. They have a couple of little issues, but you have to, you know, they're probably pretty much all solved by now. But this is the amazing part. When I say earlier, when I said earlier before I ate all this, that and I was feeling very generous when I said 911s have no fundamental issues. This is it. I mean, at a time where Ferraris were going from six seconds to sixty to ten or eleven seconds to sixty, or altogether leaving the market or, for certain models, <laughs> like seventy four with seventy five, there was no Ferrari. You can only get three hundred eighty yeah. um, in the U.S. Uh, and Porsche, yeah, we never got another twelve cylinder car in from Ferrari officially in the United States for another decade, right? Till the Testarossa came out. 
And those that we did have here just got slower and slower and slower. Yeah. And I've said before, if you want to ever be depressed, go read Road Test from 1978. Just yeah. go read A Car and Driver, Road and Track from 1978. It was dire, dire times. Yeah. Um, so the fact that they were, by 78, were, were already had engineered a solution to meet emissions mm -hmm. and be back to where they were pre-78 is fucking unbelievable. Yeah, because nobody Cause no else, else got there was until, able, yeah, probably the mid-80s. Yeah, 85, 86. Yeah. It was the, the 16-valve craze, the four-valve per cylinder craze that finally got everyone everyone back yeah uh, to where they had been pretty yeah. amazing so yeah those so those cars are right rightfully respected and desired and revered uh and then in 84 came the consequences of the line having been extended they said oh we're gonna actually start developing the car more and engineering solutions to it uh and so they switched the big news was the 3.2 liter engine which uh is electronically fuel injected with bosch metronic mm -hmm. uh and so that's a major advancement other changes were relatively minor. I mean, like, basically none, actually. The big change was the powertrain mm -hmm. uh, for 84, and then they came out with a new manual transmission for 87, which everyone fetishizes now, the G50 transmission. Mm -hmm. And the prior transmission, the five-speed, you know, you can identify the difference between these transmissions if based on the location of reverse. Mm -hmm. Reverse is below fifth on the 915, and it's next which to... Which is the early gearbox. Yes, the early one. Mm -hmm. And then uh, next to first, like a BMW uh, starting in 87. It has internal self-springing, so the gear lever centers on the three to four axis, so you, it's a lot easier to tell where you are. People shit on 915s a lot. When they're worn out, they are pretty miserable. Uh, it can be hard to find the gear you're looking for, and you have to be gentle about selecting the gear and sort of read the gearbox. It's not a car to slam into gear. It's a car that you drive like an old car where you just have to read what the synchro mesh is doing and sort of, it takes some initiating. It's like driving an old car. But if you, once you get the hang of it, it's easy, it's easy, easy to use. You just have to be sympathetic. You can't, sl whereas a G G50, you kind of can just drive it like a modern car, slam it into gears. It doesn't really care. Yeah, but even modern cars should be shifted with three fingers on, exactly. a, on the knob. That's it. Exactly. Never with this fist bullshit. I'm exactly. Said, said this too many times. Uh, okay, so, so Career the, 3.2 comes out as mostly powertrain differences. Most, in 84, and then the car was developed pretty continuously. The big change was the gear, gearbox change for 87, uh, when you went to a hydraulic clutch during that time also instead of a cable clutch. So the, those, the only major mechanical issue with 3.2s was premature valve guide wear. A lot of those cars got head jobs pretty early in their lives, you know, 50 or 60,000 miles. They, they just smoked. They smoked, yeah. that's right. Uh, so that was a common 3.2 issue, but otherwise they're bulletproof the only computer in the car is the ecu um otherwise you know the no, engine computer yes control unit. there's no abs there's no power steering uh you know it's still torsion bar springs uh, which is pretty old-fashioned for the 1980s but the cars are kind of magical to drive especially when well set up the only other uh, torsion bar car i can think of in the 80s other than a alpha milano was a honda crx first gen crx was torsion bars interesting it's something that i always forget and i'm freaked um, out there have it. to be others yeah there have to be uh we should do an episode maybe on the yeah milano and gtv6 that's probably yeah that's true yeah, very rare kind of Kind of yeah, it was a treatment that was not common any longer in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, so those cars are very simple and robust as long as they've had the engines done and uh, some of my favorites. Uh, and they're 20-year-old cars at this point. Yes, right? correct. I mean, the fundamental architecture 20 is 20 years, years old. old. And it's really super obvious in the interior because now you're getting into the yuppie era. And so they're all red for this reason because it's the 80s. Uh, and they all have leather interiors and they all have sunroofs for the U.S. market. And power mirrors are added and air conditioning is standard equipment basically for the U.S. market by this period. And so you get this addition of all this shit in a car that was never supposed to have that stuff. And that's why when you look at these cars closely, you're just like, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> just stuff is strewn all over the interior for switches you know case in point is the adjusting of the electric mirrors the joystick is on top of the right door kind of in a place where you're like yeah that's a reasonable place the to left door the left door the driver's door yeah. where you'd expect the joystick for the electric mirrors the switch to switch from left to right mirror however is um 
not visible at all. It's underneath the dashboard and it's a rocker switch that's left or right. And that's like, it, it's miles away from the joystick. Sunroof switch is also mo- located under the dash and unmarked. And you just have to know that it's there. The wipers. Variable intermittent wiper. Yeah, the wiper. Rheostat. So so the rheostat is just between two gauges, whereas all the other wiper controls are on a stock. I mean, it's just shit strewn around like confetti. The HVAC controls are located in three separate locations. There's a master switch between the seats for the heater boxes and then the air conditioning stuff's ahead of the shifter and then on the dashboard there's like another thing where you're like i don't know what the fuck any of this means <laughs> it's all rocket science uh so like it's kind of an ergonomic disaster it's all stuff where if you drive the car for a week you figure it out but people bitch about it endlessly and there's it's nonsensical and of course all that is because they added all the stuff because the car is by this point a forty thousand dollar car and expectations to, from yuppie people who are buying these cars instead of weird sports car nuts uh, is that the car should have a bunch of features in it uh, at that given the price point. Mm-hmm. Um, then the 964 arrives. That's the most substantial change that the 911 got at all. What year is this? This is 89 okay. for the Carrera 4. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the 959 arrives in 86, and it's full of technology and computers. I mean, like... So you're throwing out numbers there for a second. Let's let's. The 959 is not really a 911. The 959 was a development. It started of as a 911 underneath there somewhere. It has the same windows and the dashboard looks like a 911. Yeah, and in the back end looks like it's it's over fendered 911. But mm-hmm. it is that was Porsche's basically technology showcase. Think of it as it's a the predecessor a, of the Carrera GT. Exactly, Carrera GT or 918. So that's yes. its own kind of thing. It's a super, It's a hypercar. Right. It's a full on hypercar. They built 200 something of them. They were like obscene money you know in deutschmarks i think it was the first car to hit a million deutschmarks which was six hundred thousand dollars yeah and they still lost money on all of them one of the most amusing things that i about the 959 when i interacted with one for the first time was i opened the trunk and it's like tiny because it's just full of huge computers everything is it's four-wheel drive twin turbocharged i mean it was just like maximum technology water for that heads with an air water correct Yes, yeah, also true. Crazy. I think it's cylinders might have been air cooled also. Just the heads were, yeah. were water cooled. Uh, so it's like a technological showcase. When the 964 comes out, it has it debuts with four wheel drive, and this was aimed at curbing the wayward handling of the 911 because the, th- the 32 was still considered to have you know deeply unsafe limit handling because it would lead with the back end. Right. Um, so four-wheel drive was introduced to try and tame that, and the 964 was supposedly 80-something percent new, even though you look at it and you're like, it kind of looks like the same car, yeah. and inside and out. But they but did change was, a lot of stuff. Right. Substantial Substantive technical changes and aesthetic, Power too. steering. Power steering was standard. Uh, For the but, first time ever, right? It was the first available. time it was ever offered. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it was, and it was standard except for in the uh, Carrera RS. Mm-hmm where it was manual steering. Uh, and you switched to McPherson struts. Yeah, so it got rid of the torsion bars. So it That's got coil huge... springs for the first time. Yep. And uh, you also got ABS as mm-hmm. standard. And it has computer-controlled systems for checking stuff in the car. And, you know, the four-wheel drive system was pretty fancy. And it had the electric rear spoiler that went up at, you know, 45 or 50 miles an hour. Uh, it was just like a very high-tech car. I remember when this car came out, my dad was like, holy shit, it's like a 959 for poor people. And he Poor-ish. got really excited and, and bought one and he still has it. Um, but it, a big technological leap. Twin plug ignition, also 3.6 liters. So meaningful increase in torque and Same power basic engine, as well. Right? Same basic engine, still a single overhead cam. They were, these are were all single overhead cams, uh, 12 valves, all of them. Uh, and so th- there was a big technological leap. These cars were derided because I said this before. They had some technical problems, and people thought they were ugly. Uh, I always thought they were pretty cool looking, as long as you have the right wheels and stance. U.S. trim suspension height is kind of ugly, uh, but well, higher than. And the those cars are now very revered, but for a while they were like the 996s of their day for sure. Mm-hmm. Just like long, like, uh, and this is one of the cyclical things about Porsche. Mid years for a long time were like, oh, uh, here's the shitty one that you can buy for eleven grand because you can't afford an SC. And then 964s were like that, 
where you're like, oh, you can't afford a 993, which is the replacement of the 964, which we'll get to momentarily. Uh, and, you know, cheap and, sh and people derided them. But what happens is they get, the problems get sorted and then the, the bad rep basically gets resolved. Yeah. Uh, and then you people objectively are like, wait a minute, this thing only costs this much and it like drives 97% or 91% the same as this other one, which is worth twice as much, like sign me up. Yep. And then they are not undervalued anymore. So that happened with mid-years, it happened with... Uh, 964s and maybe you know has is happening too with 996s now also mm -hmm. oh yeah i mean they went from 15 to twenty five thousand right. dollars. that's a huge it, as a percentage it's an yeah. increase but it's still not very many dollars right. for 911s given what other 911s cost uh and then so then the 993 comes out and it's basically an evolution of the 964 got a completely new rear suspension design with multi-link arrangement it got restyled in a way that everyone thinks is more attractive i don't but most people do uh, and it went to a six-speed transmission and then a uh, slight power increase for the first year. And then the second year, they introduced uh, Vario Cam, variable valve timing. Uh, and sorry, Vario Ram. Ram. Vario Cam is the system that was used in the 968 four-cylinder front-wheel drive, front yeah, engine car. Yeah, you can't car. do a variable valve timing with a single cam. You can, I guess, but no one did. So it's very, um, very yes, very Ram. Very Ram, which is a variable volume or a variable length intake runner right. system that a lot of other people were doing at this time. Uh, and that increased power by 12 horse, horsepower. Did it really? From usually those 270 used, to 282. That's very interesting because usually they're used to really bolster mid-range torque. So I maybe. don't have the torque numbers in my head, it unfortunately. Pro it probably did both. Right. I mean, they yeah. probably come up a compromise that cost 12 horsepower, but gave 12 pound feet of torque. And now they could get both of them back or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the last of the air cooled cars. Those were 95, 96, 97, 98 only. 95 are OBD1 non variable RAM. And they were very RAM from 96 on. And that's the basic evolution of the mm -hmm. car. The thrown out completely and replaced with a clean sheet 996. Yes. With all new engines that were water cooled and twin overhead cams with Vario cam. Vario cam, yeah. Yes. Um, and shared nothing, not a single part with the predecessor, right? For the first time ever. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's a single part shared. I mean, like maybe, a, a maybe the mirror adjustment switch or something like that. Yeah. Something I mean, like the seats that. look similar. There's a lot of stuff that was very much an evolution of 993, but really mm -hmm. that was a clean sheet design yes. made to be uh, much, much cheaper to produce. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting when you look at like 993 reviews, because right now we look at 993 values and they're astronomical. These cars are very expensive. Yes. Um, period road tests of them are wild to read because they're like it's a charming old thing yes like every there are constant well and just really entertaining old. yes they liked the car dynamically and had a lot of spirit and chutzpah mm -hmm. but it was also just wildly old-fashioned quirky and old I and mean, that yes. was what they just all kept saying but it's, which it's possible to imagine they're 35 years old is still true today also they're still quirky, they're still quirky and, and old. old yeah but you know, all cars from 1995 are right. quirky or old now. But the weird thing is that this car was so old in its couple, yes. first couple of years, it'd be the same thing as going into a dealership and buying a brand new 1997 Camry at this point. Yeah. Yep. That's nuts. Yep. I mean, that's a long time ago. But dynamically, they were always wildly entertaining, like really rewarding driver's cars. And, you know, they you watch the period um, marketing materials and Porsche spinning it positively, which is, you know, that that, that is a tried and true formula that is proven and it, I mean, it was true i mean mm -hmm. the car the the combination of the cars like performance and usability and livability were pretty still pretty unmatched uh among all sports cars you know maybe nsx but nsx doesn't have the package packaging right utility of the large back seats and all of that so anyway that is the crash course on the 911 this is a small fraction of the information i carry around in my head but um it's a wonder you fit through the door yes for my my large head um it's fascinating those cars are this is and this is why they are what, what you said about their unique combination of drivability usability fundamental goodness packaging all the rest of the stuff is why they're always the obvious choice for for the uh, car collectors, so you have one car, you're just going to buy a 911, and that's why we make fun of it. But you know, I, let me make that really clear: there's there's inherent greatness in these cars that I love. I yeah. just wish I had space in the garage for one, especially a long hood short wheelbase car. I've never had so much fun in my life as I drove uh, Porsche put together uh, a little program out of their museum at Weissach, which is their proving grounds. Uh, which is a concrete canyon track. I mean, you're going to hit a wall if you fuck up anything. Um, 
and uh, they had basically one of every 911. So it was a, a short wheelbase 65. That that they did not let us drive on track. That was street only. Um, and then everything from the mid-year cars up. Um, and it was wild to just graduate through the years and see what mm-hmm. happened. Because um, a lot of them feel, they feel similar to each other. And you you can tell they're related, but also there are some really stark yeah. differences. And there are also stark differences based on model and mm-hmm. like setup. These cars are incredibly sensitive to setup. And so like when I drive a stock 993 Carrera 4, mm-hmm. I kind of hate it, honestly. Like the cars have to be set up right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's pretty easy to do. I mean, you, you need to sort of control the body motion and just increase the volume. And that makes a meaningful difference and Im- improvement. But the like variations between model and, and con- it's true of 911s now too. The character of a GT3 now is very different from a or turbo, turbo or, or, yeah. or a you know Carrera there's really even though they all look the damn same right. there's incredible Very variations good. in experience a turbo cab is not the same experience as a GT3 RS no very, very different. And that was true in the old days also. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it, the more of them you drive, the more you realize how different like a 73 Carrera is from a 65 911 is from a, you know, early 930, even though they're all five years apart from each other. Is there, was there a bad one? Hmm. <sighs> it's kind of subjective. You know, when you do a cabriolet, you lose structural rigidity and aesthetics. And so there's a reason why now cabriolets are worth like a third less than equivalent coupes. You know, so are they bad? No, they're not. No, none of them are bad. But it's sort of, you know, I miss the structure. When I drive a, a nine, a, a, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the um, cowl shake and just lack of structure. Like, I really miss it in a 911 because the purpose of a 911 is to haul the mail for me on a good road. And a car like that, we have missed the structure is, you know, problematic. Okay. So, yeah, that's there. None of them are bad. But um, depending on your mission and what you prioritize, you should buy the right car. For me, it has to be rear wheel drive. Um, for me, it has to be rear wheel drive and, no and naturally steering. aspirated and no power steering for me. I'm OK with the power. St- Remember the power steering in my 964? It, it's very good. But give me a Carrera. 3.2, so I have modern engine management. And yeah. Carrera 3.2 has got a lot more top end than SC does. SC is kind of a flat torque curve, and 3.2 yes. is very spicy by comparison. Especially um, when you do a couple little things to it. I'm just, I drove them all stock. Mm-hmm. Um, but that uh, combined with snow tires on a racetrack was easily one of the most fun mo- cars I've ever driven. Um, yep. And it's just a nice set of compromises that meets up with what I want. To me, it is the benchmark for steering. I know that you treat the Lotus that way. I just, the steering wheel on the Lotus is too small for me. I can't have a good time with the steering wheel too small. Okay. I mean, you know, I'll, even 996, which was power steering and not particularly known for its steering um, in the 911 lineage is better than just about anything on sale today. I mean, other than McLarens, which are still hydraulic and really, really talkative and good. Uh, I would say even a 996 is, is better steering than any other car on the road. Yeah. Um, so 964 is great also, but I really love the sensation of the mass moving behind you. It's the defining yes. characteristic. Yes. So to me, all of the 911s until 997 and a half and, and 991 were that on the, there's very little weight on the front and a lot more on the back. And so you have a much higher natural frequency of the suspension up front. So you kind of get a quick up and down, quick up yes. and down. And in the back, you don't get that so much. It's much more slowed down, but you get a left right. Mm-hmm. So as you're driving, the front end of the car is up down. The back end is left right. And you get this sort of like undulation over the road that never quite stops Mm -hmm. every time you turn the wheel the slightest little motion you'll have a half a second delay and then the back sort of responds Mm -hmm. and when that happens you get a tug in the reverse direction with steering it is the defining characteristic of every 911 up until the 991.1 some you know late 997s maybe a little bit less so and the four-wheel drive ones less so but it is the best thing in the world to feel that nudge back because you know you have caged animal behind you and you went there and he over to the other side of his cage and now you're pissing him off and you know keep going on a slalom and you realize he's gonna fucking bite you and it was the greatest communication the greatest dialogue you can have with a car is that and the elise doesn't have that because you don't feel weight transfer so because it's in the center mass is in the middle of the car yeah so um so yes that's why but like i said you know it's an unimaginative choice and so it's the car you drive for yourself 
9-11 ownership is approved if you're driving it for yourself. If you're driving it for other people as a flex or for street cred, then, Get a turbo cab then you should sell your car because there are real drivers out there who deserve to own these cars for fifteen or $20,000, which is what they used to cost. And I really am just, that's my least favorite thing about all of this is that you used to be able to buy a Carrera 3.2 that was wonderful for 20 and like pretty decent and usable for 15. Mm -hmm. And that's so tragic that those days are gone because everyone who's driving around is like, what should I buy? You know, I guess I'll get an E36 M3 since I have $15,000 to spend on an enthusiast car. All these people who are driving enthusiasts deserve to be driving around in air-cooled 911s because it's very incomparable. And if you ever thought Derek wasn't an old man, this in my day speech has been brought to you by Metamucil. Well, it's working, <laughs> so I've got to go. Ew. Uh, okay, thank you for that uh, encyclopedic vomit of You're Airbnb 911 information. Plenty more where that came from. I, we should do a follow up. I mean, I, I, listen, I do actually find it interesting. I would love to do a year-by-year -year spotter's guide. In fact, you guys should comment in the... In if the, you think that would be interesting. Yeah, I think otherwise... it would be interesting to, to do it in one place where you can say this is definitively a 72 because, and we're looking at a photo on this. This is actually television behind us. And so we could have a picture of every year. And I'll make a PowerPoint. <laughs> Perfect. I'm in. I'm in. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us. Tune in next week for another episode of The Carmudgeon Show. We'll see you there. I'll see you there. Here. Here. I'll see you here. Okay. Bye.